good afternoon, everyone, and good talk, my dear friends. Okay, uh, I'm Xin Xian Tai, also serving as the PI uh, for the Pilot Social Science uh, Research Project for Taiwan uh, Net Zero Pathways. Uh, now I'm going to explain uh, very quickly uh, why uh, we have today's session knowledge exchange. Uh, this, the um, pilot social science research project is a comprehensive research project and uh, uh, initiative supported by National Science and Technologies Council, NSTC. And after uh, uh, more than one year of hard work, yeah, many people here have been involved in the uh, hard working process. Uh, after more than one year of work, uh, now we have uh, a research blueprint. Now you can see uh, them. Uh, the research pro project covers five major research topics, uh, just transition and uh, uh, analysis on renewable energy policy and uh, spatial planning, analysis on net zero pathways uh, for high carbon emission industries, a transform uh, transformation-oriented integrated evaluation model, and uh, uh, research on net zero social and lifestyle transition. So uh, totally we have 10 teams, yeah. Surely we don't have enough time for every team to uh, present what, what they are working on. But today uh, we are happy to invite two uh, teams. The first one is trans uh, just transition team, the second one is the modeling team uh, led by uh, Professor Xu. Uh, he's, he's there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you for all the members' hard work. And uh, 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 the teams are going to uh, present the major challenges we face in Taiwanese context and also uh, present uh, how we how we adjust all these challenges and surely your comments and suggestions are highly welcomed so um, that's uh, what we are going to do in today's knowledge exchange session so now uh, let's firstly uh, invite Dr. Zhang Sunnan to talk about uh, realizing just transition in Taiwan thank you Um, thanks for the introduction of um, Dr. Dai. Uh, could you all hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Shunan Jiang, a postdoc researcher in the Just Transition Project led by Dr. Zhang Liu of National Taiwan University. I'm very glad to have the opportunity today to share with you some of this project's research focus and status. As this title indicates, one unique feature of this project is its connection with policy making. In particular, how could the project keep informed of policy progress and at the same time try to inform and contribute to the ongoing policy process? This becomes the main challenge for this project. Um, so let me begin. Let me begin with. Uh, Okay, yeah. Let me begin with a brief policy background of just transition in Taiwan. There are two key milestones in terms of just transition policy making. First is the National Development Council's publication of Taiwan's pathway to net zero emissions in 2050. The NDC specifies 12 key strategies for Taiwan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And just transition is one of them. It is also recognized the overarching principle for, other, for the other 11 strategies. Second, the Taiwan government passed the Climate Change Response Act this year. Following the enactment um, of the law, the NDC has established the Just Transition Commission and had the first meeting in June. These policy progresses suddenly makes 
just transition a quite popular concept in Taiwan. But how should we understand just transition in Taiwan's context? Our team identifies some basic factors when considering just transition in Taiwan. First, the progress of energy transition resonates with the history of industrial transformation in Taiwan. And we need to learn from what has happened in, the his, in this historical period. Second, difference from, difference from the earlier focus of just transition in other countries, coal production has long been phased out in Taiwan. Fossil fuel industry is also not a key policy focus. Third, by contrast, the most visible controversy surrounding energy transition in Taiwan right now is the intense land use conflict over renewable energy. And fourth, we should also focus on the highly unequal distribution of carbon emission among industries, indicating the priority to transform high carbon emission industries. Finally, we should also recognize Taiwan's very low labor unionization rate making it very difficult for workers to voice their concerns collectively. So based on this understanding, the project has four aspects of focus. First is impact assessment, which includes using evidence-based analysis to identify vulnerable groups and study past examples of industrial transformation to inform current policy making. Second is about government, government capacity, which considers the institutional framework for the operation of the newly established Just Transition Commission. Third is about social dialogue, which centers on improving the procedure of bringing stakeholders into dialogue and consultation. And the final aspect is about labor rights, including legal basis for labor rights but also the practical means to engage with workers and facilitate their awareness of just transition. So, um, so this is the, the, the overall framework of the project. Um, the just transition team consists of five research groups. This diagram demonstrates the collaboration among these five groups of scholars. Above is the overall vision. So how to attend to vulnerable groups during the process of energy transition so that we could achieve a carbon neutral and a more equal society by 2050. And below shows the work we envision that we need to carry out. There are two primary components. One involves the baseline analysis to, under, to understand the pre-existing inequality condition in Taiwan regarding energy consumption and production and also carry out the labor market impact assessment. The other component is about how to craft critical policy strategies to address issues that we identify. And we think that um, this critical policy strategy involves three aspects of effort as shown here. Stakeholder um, dialogue procedure, government capacity, and legal and institutional pro um, protection of labor rights. So moving forward, there are some policy issues that, that, we are, um, that we are focusing on at this point. In particular, we are keeping an eye on the operation of the Just Transition Commission, which just held its first meeting. Equally important is the 25 public consultation meetings scheduled to happen in the following few months. So to conclude my presentation, as I mentioned in the beginning, another important aspect of this research is how to be policy informed and policy informing at the same time. To be policy informed means that we need to monitor policy development collectively across governmental agencies and then set our research agenda aligning with policy development so that, we would, so that we wouldn't be too late to provide any policy input. Then how could we respond to the policy development in time? One major effort comes from the NSTC, um, which aims to develop platforms between governmental agencies 
to exchange ideas and provide suggestions. Besides the platform, we may also hold events that could bring different governmental agencies together to exchange ideas informally. So to be clear, the main challenge is how to make a balance between informing policy in time and ensuring research integrity. And for now, our strategy is to develop a two-track working agenda. One is for long-term research plan, and the other is for short-term policy input. Overall, we are still learning how to develop policy input in a responsive, yet responsible way. And we hope to receive any feedback from other scholars. I will stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. And now uh, let's invite uh, uh, Professor Xu to talk about integrated modeling in Taiwan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Taiwan. And for Taiwanese, uh, thanks to be here. <laughs> okay. okay, my name is Xu Xingwei from National Taipei University of Technology. Uh, it's today's topic I want to share. Uh, in the morning's discussion, I think everybody agrees that uh, for net zero target, uh, we need a well-defined pathway. It's a very important thing. Uh, in order to help us uh, indicate a specific technology or a policy to, to be introduced uh, in a specific year uh, or its impact. Uh, so we want to build up a more comprehensive uh, integrated assessment tool and build up an information platform as our target uh, in this project. However, uh, when we thinking about this problem, uh, we think uh, there are three key challenges for apply the model application to navigate the transition uh, net to the net rate of the first uh, challenge, I, we, I think, we think uh, is uh, comprehensiveness. Due to the diversity and the inter, uh, inter in, uh, due to the diversity of net zero issues, uh, there are uh, many different scholars in different areas. They may own their own models, and uh, their model may have various results in the end. However, uh, it's based, it, however, we cannot say, uh, we cannot label the, uh, the model is right and the model is wrong. It's not working like this way. Because uh, the difference may come from the uh, basic uh, theoretical assumption difference. That's not because who is right or who is wrong. There's, we have to know there's no one model is perfect, no perfect model. So uh, they are, their model is just because uh, they want to focus on a specific area to explain a specific, uh, uh, special things. And uh, each model has this advantage and disadvantage. So we want to integrate them together to, comp to build up a comprehensive model. It's a very important thing, but it's a very challenging thing. And the second issue, our second challenge is the consistency. Uh, even if we, if we use the same model tools, but the input data or the input scenario is different, of course, the results should be different in the end. However, in usually we do not discuss the input. We, all, we, we, we always just go through the, the end the, to discuss the result. It's meaningless because we don't know why and how in the beginning, how can we discuss the end of the results. So consistent in the beginning should be the most important thing. And if we use the different model and we use different data, it's impossible to be compared. It's incomparable. So, the, we, the first thing in model to analyze the natural carbon emission, we, the first thing we should build up a consistency in the data, in the input, in the scenario. It's the second thing we think is very important to, to be start. And the third thing is uh, localization. I mean localization. In, li in this project, uh, we, I, we do not want to build up a new, totally new model, no. We will thoroughly apply some model already be foremost well known in the, in the, in, in the global. But some model, we introduced the model from uh, other countries, but the data inside still be the international data. And if we want to use the model to help us, to help Taiwan, to help us to analyze the net carbon emission scenario, the local data should be very important. Else, it will have some bias in the future, and we, can, we cannot know, and others will also challenge us. But local data actually is not a very easy thing. Some data will hold on some government agency. And some data, maybe it's very important, but they may not be exist right now, okay? 
So the false charge is trustworthy or trustworthy. As um, the model, of course, is very important, but uh, in usually most of the model have a high entry barri barriers. That means that even, even you are the scholar or researcher, but if we are in the different areas, you are not very easy to understand my model. Of course, uh, for me, I am also very hard to understand your model because of different areas things. For the public, it's the same. For most of the people, they want to understand how its model work, but most of the people cannot easily understand how it work. In this part, we will try to enhance the communication between different researchers. And also, we are trying to let model teams to communicate with public stakeholders to write down some, doc write down some doc document to let uh, the public can understand and read how the model works. And the fifth challenge is understandable. Because uh, most of the model, the results are a lot of numbers. Use the number to show the result. It's the model's property. But the numbers is very hard to read and understand for most of the people. So in this part, in order to let the results readable and understandable, so visualization, try to write something, uh, try to make some finger on the online, on system to let like, visualize, visualize, to let like, public more easy to understand, to catch the point is a very important thing. And the sixth challenge is, oh, I, I use the term miscommunication. What means mis miscommunication? Because the model thing uh, in usually are served to uh, some government agency or served to uh, some uh, research institution. But uh, and this government agency or research institution, they may have their own viewpoint. And sometimes uh, the analysis will based on that viewpoint to build out the scenario. But that viewpoint may not be the same with the stakeholder or the public. The stakeholder or pub public may have their own thinking for the possible future uh, scenario or their thinking. So we are trying to uh, discuss with the stakeholder in the future to build up the, the scenario, helping the stakeholder and the public use the integrated model, helping them to analyze what the impact in the future look like. And also, Sometimes uh, we just want to quickly know some basic answer. So uh, quickly analyze online analysis, analyze it too. We think it should be built up. Okay, so it's the sixth charge, but this charge uh, is a major part. I think this one is the major part in today's discussion, but this challenge are uh, still be very difficult to uh, solve. Okay, it's the, the first challenge uh, is our, our project uh, structure look like this way. We, for the first part, uh, we invite many former uh, research team uh, into this project. But uh, I, I think I would just not, not, not just go through in very detail in, in, in the following pages, but just uh, give some example. For example, uh, we invite or cooperate with a very famous uh, research institution. It's called Industry Technology Research Institution, ISHI. ISHI team uh, is the Taiwan, owns the Taiwan Times model, Taiwan Times model. And it helped us to do the uh, supply side pathway planning. Its output may look like, uh, like the power generation structure and capacity or the energy consumption and the cost. But for the integrated model, one's output may be others' input. So for example, uh, the times model's output, energy consumption and the cost may be the other energy uh, economic model's input. In here in our project, uh, we we invite uh, is a professor Lin Shimo Lao in Zhongyuan Christian University and Xiao Dai Ji Lao Shi. I think it should be here. Okay, we have the ECME model. It's also a very famous global model, and it, uh, it, the energy consumption and cost may be the input of ECME model. The ECME model is an economic model can help us to analyze the the policy impact, like the carbon tax rate or even carbon tax rate. What the impact for the uh, GDP growth or the industry structure or the renewable energy investment. So this may be its output. Then the output may be the times model's input. So it has the input, output, input, output has a closed loop and it's called soft link until their results converge to a small error rate. Then we, it converge to a stable reason. Result. It's look like, it would look like this way, but you can see we still have another model here. It's an invariant model, CMAQ model, lift model. So it's a very complex word. Okay, I do not go through, it's very detailed. And it's a comp uh, complex model, integrated model. We will use this to do the communication with the public people and help 
us to answer the question we want. Okay. And for the two to four, uh, uh, the, the church we did mention uh, before, the consistent, uh, sorry, consistent uh, localization and trustworthiness. Of the consistent, of course, we need uh, each in, the, in each model team we need to share the data. But it's not only share the data. Uh, first thing is we have to provide the data we have right now. But the, it, different team, they may have the different data. They may use the different data. We need to communicate first which data is reasonable. Then build out a shared database. It's the first version database. Then the second thing, localization. We need to ask to or to ask the government if you, do you have a well, data we need we, we have we want. Maybe they have, maybe they do not have. And maybe some important factor we need, but actually they do not have any data right now in Taiwan. We have tried to create it. How to create it? Maybe we can build a communication of technology expert team to do the to ask them and discuss them frequently. And also for the public and or the NGO or the other stakeholder. They may want have some scenario they want to uh, simulate or want to analyze. So we will also do the communication, public participation, to uh, get the public pass, and uh, then use the scenario in our model to help them to do the to uh, to do the assessment to help them to visualize their their their, 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 their the future they want. And the fifth and sixth uh, is understandable. Is as we mentioned, is visualization. And the uh, six uh, miscommunication is open to help uh, people easy to understand. So when <coughs> when the pathway, when the when the public pathway have built, we will help the public to analyze some some uh, possible future. Okay. So but but uh, it's not enough. The visualization platform will make the result more easy to readable. Else, even I, we help them to analyze, they still cannot understand what that means. And as I mentioned, an open analysis platform. On how to achieve an analyze platform, we should modelize the model. Some result, we should modelize the model and use the mo modelized model to get to have a roughly result that make uh, the analyze not too complex, can be get very quickly uh, online. That's what the idea we know. So the point is optional. Okay, that, that means that public can click the scenario they, they need online. Okay, and can get a, the roughly answer. It may, may, may not be very exactly right, but we can get, provide a roughly answer. So that's totally idea uh, for the sixth challenge. And for our project, because our project is a numerical model based uh, project, so our function is pre support to the government and pre communication to the public. So for some, uh, for some example, at least here, we have some now, uh, now some uh, policy like uh, couple free, we are now recently discussed very often, and like the uh, uh, regulation goal or something like that. We will do uh, the analysis, use the comprehensive re uh, integrated plan modeling to help the government to pre-analyze the result and compare with other teams, try to make the discussion more efficiently. It's, pro <coughs> it's a pre-support to the government. And Sometimes, as I mentioned, we will do a communication with the public, help the public to uh, analyze the pathway they need or they want or they uh, thinking in their mind. So it's called the pre-communication to the public. Uh, also, we, it can help them to compare with the pathway of the government. So it's called pre-post-communication with the public. That's the function uh, in our project. And I, I, I list some uh, discussion point, but I think I, I do not need to read by turn. It's just a, a reference for everybody if, if, if we can discuss more. Of, of course, if, if, if you have some successful example you want to share, it's very welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my sharing uh, today will be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Xu. And now uh, we have QA time, so uh, let's invite uh, the on-site audience uh, responses, suggestions, comments, please. Okay, Professor Ren. Microphone, please.
Well, thank you very much for a very uh, powerful and also uh, very informing presentations. Um, I have two questions uh, to each of you. Uh, the first one, again, was on this um, Taiwan transition uh, plan. And you mentioned very often the main conflict is really about land use. And my question is, what is that or what does it entail? I mean, you can use a lot of roofs, you can use facades in build environments for having at least solar, management, solar energy, um, which doesn't really require additional space. Wind energy is different and geothermal probably too. I don't know if you use that here because uh, that's also a, a renewable energy source. But I would like to know a little bit more about what renewable energy is being used in terms of space requirements. Because in urban environments, you can use urban space. And my second question goes to you, basically. I mean, I was, again, very impressed by this, you know, uh, comprehensive and uh, integrative assessment methods. I mean, that's really, uh, you know, state of the art. What I would like to know is when you said you integrate stakeholders and the public, are they involved in setting the parameters? Are they involved in asking questions and then getting, you know, kind of results, what the system would tell them about questions? In which way are they actually involved in addition to giving data? You made that clear that, you know, they provide data. So what is their use of the model in terms of their participation? Okay, thank you. So for the first question, actually we have a team, uh, the uh, renewable energy policy and uh, spatial planning team, but now Professor Chen is not here. Okay, okay, uh, Professor Wang, maybe you can answer uh, Professor Ren's question, thank you. Yeah, so, well, there, um, in, in Taiwan, because we have so limited land, so the land competition, land use competition is huge. So in terms of the renewable energy development, so we agree with you that uh, in the built environment, that should be put the priority for having the rooftop solars and uh, other kinds of uh, renewable energy. But thing is that uh, in 2016, we set up very ambitious goal that in uh, 2025, we will be having 20 gigawatt of solar, which means not only the rooftop solars, we might need to have, well, uh, ground mounted, uh, large scale uh, solar development to meet the goal. So that's pretty much the, the, the starting point to create all these conflicts. So uh, that's why in one of the projects that Professor Zhao, uh, she's from urban planning and the team is now trying to figure out what's the best siting strategy and what kind of the siting strategy incorporated with grid planning uh, by incorporating the stakeholders can be the options for pathways that Taiwan can choose. So I, I just uh, partly answer your question, but there's a huge debate between the land use and, and the renewable energy development. Yeah, actually, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, the difficulties, I think the setting up the solar cells on the land and on the cities are different. So that's why we are right now, I think they put a lot of the area for the solar cell in the land, in the countryside, and try to uh, get the support from the countryside, from, even from the agriculture. But exactly that is a conflict between the agriculture uh, purpose and also the renewable energy. But someone will ask why we put the effort mostly in the last few years only on the countryside uh, instead of the the urban, uh, the urban uh, the, in the city, that's simply because the social resistance is different. The social power is different. Well, I make only comment on that, yeah. Yeah, uh, Professor Zhou, yeah. Actually, the uh, solar panel just uh, put in the agriculture area now is a contested issue, a big contested issue in Taiwan. Just uh, one month ago, uh, over 80, 80 scholars signed uh, to monitor the government have to, to notice these things. And they organized the so-called 
energy just transition uh, surveillance yeah, alliance, okay? So, but just the, uh, last, last uh, Wednesday, yeah, we ISPRC and Wen Ying, we have the, the released our uh, new public survey on the net zero yeah, per perception. Just only 8% uh, yeah, citizen or the interviewee answer they got of the root uh, PV. But more than, yeah, first uh, 49, first 50% citizen or the interviewee like to yeah, put uh, the root PV. I think this is very important signal. So we urge our government uh, try to re evaluate, e evaluate uh, the loop PV as possibility. I think this is also helped the citizen to know what is the uh, net zero transition come to the consciousness, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, there's a heated, heated debate about all these issues in Taiwan. So we, we need more time to discuss about all these issues. Uh, actually, uh, tomorrow in the uh, knowledge exchange session, we will invite uh, uh, the uh, renewable policy and uh, spatial planning team to uh, present what they are uh, doing. So maybe uh, uh, tomorrow we have uh, much time to, uh, more time to talk about this. And later, uh, now uh, the second question goes to Professor Xu. Okay, thanks for the questions. Uh, I think uh, the public publication I, I, I imagine in my mind is after the government's version or the things passed with version. And uh, even so, so after the after that, uh, public will have some pathway. They can be con consulted. They, they may have some idea in my mind. But sometimes, something in the public application, something some parameter, is belong to the belief. Uh, some people believe. For example, the solar solar panel, solar panel <laughs> we discussed. Some people believe. Even government tell me that we do not have so much potential. But some people believe that we have. And it's only for the solar, wind power, biofuels, or other renewable energy. Sometimes it belongs to some belief. Some people believe we have more. Some people believe we do not have so much. And carbon tax also. Even gov government give a carbon tax rate. But some people think we should have more. And the uh, electricity price is also. So some setting layer is belong to some belief or some stakeholder want. So we are trying to help learn if the permanent setting different, what the pathway look like and what is the impact look like. But we do not say your uh, thinking, your assumption, this is right. We do not promise that their assumption is right, but we help them to analyze the results, but we do not promise them it's right assumption. So and then they can use the result to compare with the government or the uh, team, team's uh, pathway. That's what our idea is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ria, do we have time for another question? We're going into the social network session, so everyone can have more discussions in, in that session time. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so now we close uh, this session. Thank you. So as I mentioned, there will be a social network time, but before we go into the tea break and social network time, we have a little activity for you all. So after sitting here for the whole day, I would like everyone to have a big stretch first, to stretch yourself a bit, to make yourself ready for all the interactions that will come afterwards. And uh, since we are here in this conference learning about new things and uh, meeting new people, I would like you, everyone to maybe reflect a bit of what we have heard this morning. And uh, what do you value on the pathway to reach net zero? What are you passionate about? And what do you think is the key to creating those pathways? Maybe try to come up with one keyword. I know it's very hard because there's a, little, a lot of stuff happening inside there. But try to come up with one keyword. And now I would like everyone to take out your smartphones or tablets or anything that can read QR codes and stand up, find someone that you have not met before. And uh, try to share first your expertise. What are you doing? Where are you from? And then uh, share what keyword resonates the most with you when you think about a net zero pathway. And then the last step will be to type in what your partner shared with you. Not your own keyword, but what the others shared with you. Okay, so please find someone that you have not met before, have not talked to today, and make new friends here.
Don't type in your own keyword, find someone else's. <laughs> Talk to someone else and put in their keyword, not your own. <laughs> Don't be shy, we are going to be here for two days all together, so let's meet someone new. To give you a bit more incentive, after you have completed this task, we have a very beautiful setup for tea time, as you have seen during the lunch break already. It's ready now for you to enjoy our tea break. Thank you, everyone. If you feel like discussing a bit more with your new partner, you can grab some snacks, grab a tea, grab a coffee, and return to this venue to talk more about your, your ideas and your, and your hopes and your vision for the future. Just to remind everyone, we have refreshments at the entrance, at the front desk, for everyone to take.
要先宣布是谁。那我说等下等跟打打那个就是视讯嘛，就是可能要先引导他，就要直接用麦克风讲，因为我怕。To remind everyone, we have some refreshments outside, and uh, I forgot to mention that it's all lacto-vegetarian. So if you don't eat meat, it's all safe for you. It's vegetarian. Okay, so welcome back everyone for the final session today. We have a keynote speech by Professor Dr. Daniela Jakob from Climate Research Center Germany, who is joining us online. So this session will be moderated by Professor Li Mingshu and uh, researcher Li Xinji, who will, uh, who will be on site here. So let's welcome. Uh, OK. Uh, I think I, I'm very uh, I'm honored to be uh, helped to uh, moderate this section and uh, we are very happy to invite uh, Dr. Daniela Yokob and from the um, 
uh, Crime Cent Service Center German. Uh, currently, she is the director of the center for many years, and uh, I think in uh, the past uh, she is also the uh, the lead also for the IPCC special report on the impact of global warming of 1.0 degree Celsius above pre-industrial level, known as uh, has been known as the 1.5 degree report, and also um, she has a lot of title and also the editor-in-chief of the Crime Service and also the Scar Journal, uh, which is the Scar Journal, and she's co-founded with the Elsevier. And also he's an EcomW fellow, so, uh, and uh, unfortunately she cannot be here to be with us, but she can attend online to give us uh, a talk. And uh, uh, also for this uh, section, I invited the uh, Dr. Shinsi Lee from NCDR, and uh, you want to add something else? Okay, uh, uh, it's an honor to hear to be a moderator here because uh, we learned a lot from Garrick a couple years ago. Because, uh, Garnier gave, gave us a lot of suggestions, especially about adaptations. So NCDR, uh, climate change divisions, to have a cooperation with the, uh, with Garrick. And so, so far, we still uh, figure out new targets such as the, the presentation later, Daniel will share about uh, how can we combine the adaptation and also the uh, mitigation together. It is a big issue in Taiwan, it's not easy, so we expected the, the talk from Daniel. Thank you. Okay, so uh, please uh, give us your talk. Thank you. Hello. Hello from Hamburg and uh, good day. Uh, I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you in person, but uh, I do my best to attend remotely. Uh, I'm sorry I'm, I have some health issues and cannot travel. Um, but I, I think you are, you are having a very, very important, great workshop. And uh, I know that a few People from Germany are there, from the Riffs, but also from Gerix, and uh, I hope uh, this little keynote will trigger some discussions later on. So I switch on my slides now, and uh, hope you can see them. If not, please let me know. So can you see my slides now in full mode? Yes. Okay, okay. good. Yeah, thank you very much. So. Um, we are talking today uh, about the net zero transformation pathways and uh, and I think this is a tremendous important topic and I'm, I'm really glad that you're, you're having this workshop there and um, I'm looking forward to further collaboration. I'm very honored. Why are we talking about it? I mean, let me just uh, say a few words about setting the scene. I mean, you all know this, but uh, we do have um, the highest uh, CO2 uh, concentration and methane concentrations in the atmosphere currently, and we are unfortunately still putting uh, more into the atmosphere and changing the atmosphere. In addition, what we also know is um, from observations, and this is the um, attributable human-induced global warming um, until 2020, roughly, compared to pre-industrial times. So there is a human part in it, and let me explain you where you can see this. If you look at the, the black curve, which is very, um, very noisy, this, it's a monthly, monthly mean um, uh, uh, global uh, surface temperature um, observed. And if you look at this black curve, then you see that after the 1960s, 1970s, it, uh, it is still, uh, it is picking up here. And uh, so we are now, and you saw it probably yesterday that we are now uh, more than 1.5 degree um, uh, beyond pre-industrial times. And of course, this is changing from month to month and from year to year a little bit, but there's a clear trend. If you now use global climate modeling efforts, and you know that global climate models are kind of uh, uh, imaginary tools, they are like computer games, I will always say, uh, they are computer, they are uh, simulate image, imaginary Earth, they are simulating all processes in the different compartments of atmosphere, ocean, and land, of course. And um, with those climate models, you can, you can calculate the past and check how good they are, and then you can go into the future. 
But here, the climate models have been used in a way, and this was what actually Klaus Hasselmann has started with, uh, with the greenhouse gases or the atmospheric composition from uh, pre-industrial times. And if you do this, you see the blue curve here. So the blue curve with its variability, which you can see, is the natural uh, warming and cooling compared to the pre-industrial times, so not much of change, of course, roughly of 0.2 uh, degrees and here you can see solar uh, solar radiation impacts but uh, this is a natural the natural uh, um, variability which you all, of course also have today if you then introduce into those climate models the uh, greenhouse gases as they have been observed or they have been um, reconstructed from sediments and, and tree rings and so on. If you uh, put that in, then you come up with this um, orange curve here. So you see the orange curve is uh, also picking up in uh, around 1970s, 1980s, <clears throat> and only with these observed CO2 uh, changes uh, amount in the uh, concentration in the atmosphere CO2 plus other greenhouse gases, you can reproduce what has been measured because, as I said, the black curve is the measurement. So then the red one is, of course, the combined effect, the natural warming, so you see more variability. But it's very clear that the human-induced warming is about 1.3 degree already now. So this means, of course, um, industrial uh, industrialization and human activities during that time period have, uh, have changed the atmosphere composition of the atmosphere and thus have changed the climate. It also means that we still can have an impact on, on this. And that is what is being discussed in the COPs, as you know, and where are we here at the moment? Um, the COPs is where the, the international uh, UN parties are coming together and discussing about the future that's in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was reached um, they decided we do, don't want to go beyond 1.5 degree global uh, warming um, at the end of uh, 2000, 2100, so at the end of this century, compared to pre-industrial times. We already have 1.5 as I just, uh, 1.2 as I just showed to you, but this 1.5 degree, of course, is a climate mean. So it does not mean that if we reach now uh, 1.5 degree above pre-industrial in one year that we have already lost the goal, the Paris goal. That's, it needs to be kept in mind. Eh? So it's a long-term mean, and we don't want to cross this long-term mean. On the other hand, we are on the way with our emissions at the moment, and you see here the, the, the um, uh, uh, concentration, representative concentration pathways, we are on our way to, um, to three or four degrees with, what, with our emission releases, and that's why we talk about net zero today. So looking at the pledges from the countries, the most optimistic one ends up around, let's say, 1.8, 2, 2.5. So we are currently on a track which goes way beyond the Paris Agreement at the end. It's not a goal to cross. I mean, it's a threshold not to cross and we have to do whatever we can not to process. So, uh, and this, uh, just to remind you that the AS6 synthesis report says current trends are incompatible incom with sustainable equitable world. So we have to take action now and the action will make a difference. And the choice which we, we now uh, choose and the, it will impact life on earth for thousands of years. So it's in our hands to build a sustainable life for the future. The synthesis report also says it is possible to build a livable and sustainable future for all through climate resilient development. And I will talk about this in a minute because I think that's the most important to have in mind uh, when we think about pathways for the future. So we have to, of course, uh, take policy measures, scale up climate finances, and prioritize fairness, climate justice, inclusivity, and share our diverse knowledge. And that's why I'm so glad that we have this workshop here. And we hope we will have many more of this. So if we now look into climate resilient development, you know that IPCC, and with this, uh, of course, the scientific community, has, um, has worked for a long time with the risk propeller, that's how we call it. This is here in the center. The risk propeller, the risk is determined 
by climate hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. And uh, this, of course, is true, but it's not enough to think about. So in the last couple of years, science has advanced, and IPCC has now translated this into options to reduce climate risk and establish resilience. So for the future, the climate resilient development is the most important what we ha have to have in mind. I think this is one of the most important slides from the IPCC report, where we now have to think about um, human health and well-being, equity and justice, as at the same time with ecosystem health and planetary health. So we have to look at the human systems transition, societal transition, energy, industry, urban and rural transitions, the ecosystem transitions over land, freshwater, coastal. We just heard last, yesterday on the, in the news that there is a heat wave again in the ocean, which is attacking the coral reefs again. So, uh, so ecosystem health is very, very important for us. And these, the transitions, need to be considered, of course, in a way that we limit global warming so that we can, can end up with a fair and just and livable future. There are two important papers I just want to quickly mention to you. One is from uh, Johan Röckström and colleagues from the Earth League, um, which I consider as one of the most important papers for the decade, which came out about two months ago in Nature, and I'm sure you have seen it. They have now extended the idea about planetary boundaries to Earth system boundaries. And this means that they have introduced the uh, safe uh, um, let's say, no, uh, keeping away significant harm from humankind. So they introduced a human dimension into the planetary boundaries and, um, and clearly says that this is another, is another boundary, uh, boundary uh, condition which of course makes things more difficult because the, um, uh, um, <clears throat> the current uh, uh, life which we have is, uh, of course, has to recognize its stability and resilience of the Earth system and human well-being are inseparably linked, but at the moment this is not how we live. So I, I really like to, I will not talk about takes too long, but please look into this and look into the way how um, justice has uh, included in a way that no significant harm uh, minimize exposure to significant harm to humans from Earth system change. That's what we have to have in mind. There's another important paper from Tim Lenton and others, uh, also about eight or ten weeks ago, um, which talks about the human cost of global warming. And this paper um, talks about the niche in which humans can live. You know, if it's too cold, they die. If it's too warm, we die. So we only have a temperature niche in which we can live. And already today, climate change has put about 10% of the people outside this human climate niche. And by the end of the century, about 30% of the people, if we reach um, a warming about 2.7 uh, or 3 degrees, 30% um, or more will be put outside of this niche, which means every third or fourth person in the room will be pushed out of the out of the comfort niche here and that would mean they either have to use cooling or warming or they die or they have to go somewhere else so it's very important to have in mind that the temperature niche is directly connected with the ge geographical space where people can live in so um, this is why we have to minimize global warming and you know this figure my favorite, uh, second favorite figure, <laughs> so I have two from IPCC, where you see uh, when I was born in the 1960s to today, I have not experienced so much of global warming. But you see this in the lower row here where you see the little people here in, in yellowish. This is a temperature change again from compared to pre-industrial times uh, from 1900 to uh, 2020 roughly, and then climate change scenarios. The less emissions we, we reduce, the warmer it will get, and we end up in this uh, uh, bluish color here, uh, purple color, but uh, the two degree um, threshold or climate mitigation as much as possible will help us to stay um, in a kind of a livable way. 
But those children who are born now, your, your children, your, your grandchildren, they will experience a constant change, a, a, a change in temperature through their entire lifetime and, uh, and about much more than I had uh, experienced with, with half a degree or a bit more. Um, they might, uh, might experience uh, two degrees or more, and that is not, not livable. So that's why we have to cut emissions. So we have to, uh, to immediately act and get a, a steep emission reduction so um, that we uh, reach uh, carbon neutrality as early as possible. And let me talk a little bit about carbon neutrality now. So uh, even if we have reached um, kind of net zero, we still have to, to uh, be able to balance the net zero because we will, of course, release um, carbon dioxide. I mean, no release of carbon dioxide is, is impossible because of natural and human activities. So carbon dioxide removal, called uh, CDR, includes measures for the targeted removal of CO2 from the atmosphere and its permanent storage or end use in uh, different reservoirs. It is not a remedy. It is only something which we have to do at the end when we have cut emissions as drastically as we can in order to stabilize in, uh, in the second half of the century uh, in a kind of a net zero uh, lifestyle, let's uh, put it this way. So most important is to reduce and avoid CO2 emissions and um, to achieve the, the 1.5 targets. We, we need those uh, carbon dioxide removals. And that's technology. So what have we done at Helmholtz? We, with a few centers, uh, 15 centers, had a, a project called um, uh, Helmholtz Climate Initiatives and we looked at uh, net zero. We no looked at, at uh, the, the, how can Germany, uh, how can science, uh, German science, support the Germans' roadmap towards net zero in 2050 or 2045. And if you like, you can have a look at our products here at the web pages. Um, we developed some publications and reports, policy reports. Why is it important? Just what I told you. We also developed a net zero web atlas and a soil carbon app. So for the, for the broader public or the carbon app for, especially for uh, agricultural um, activities to understand if you do an adaptation measure or if you do your economic work, how much carbon do you release? What would be a good measure to reduce it? We developed a technological assessment framework in which we can look at the technical readiness levels of the different products and can push towards upscaling. And we developed also a net zero roadmap, which will be published by the end of this month. So the net zero roadmap is quite kind of interesting because it can be maybe transferred to other countries. We developed for Germany recommendations on when and what activities are required to achieve the goal of CO2 neutrality in Germany. And the framework for action uh, should advance the dialogue, so the engagement, the public, political, scientific debate on CO2 neutrality at various levels and to support decision making. So I think it's really important now if we look at the transformation pathways that we bring all, all players, and this means everyone, everyone on board, and support this, the dialogues and discussions on different levels. So how do we deal with the CO2 emission that despite all efforts continue to be emitted annually? And that is when the carbon dioxide removal comes into play. So for the next um, uh, few years, uh, it's crucial um, that we remove in Germany up to, uh, that we, we, rest, uh, we um, limit our emissions, and then we still have to remove about 60 million tons per, per year. And this can partly be done through biological, uh, terrestrial, stor natural storage, but we have to look at the technology. And then we uh, developed for the technology um, dialogue, uh, technological lever and decision support lever. And uh, you can look into those um, uh, in the web. So there are, uh, of course, biological CO2 removal and avoidance uh, information, but also chemical. So uh, BACS, for example, is, is here mentioned, but also the storage and utility 
um, uh, or the storage in the geological underground of CO2, but also the CO2 conversion and the utilization of CO2. So there are different options which are uh, context specific, I would say, and which are of course different in different countries. But, um, but I think it's important to have such a broad overview of options and uh, in order to get into the dialogue with uh, uh, decision supporting. We are now in a, sex, in a second phase and we will perform stakeholder dialogues for different carbon dioxide removal options. So kind of reality check, uh, which we wanna do with experts and stakeholders and, um, and then of course enhance the knowledge transfer uh, through an implementation analysis. Because we, we, we know a lot, we know also about climate change and adaptation. I haven't talked much about adaptation yet. I do it in my last three slides, but um, in, the, um, in both sides, we have to realize that the social uh, transformation needs uh, the interplay of, of, of all levels, of, of all uh, parts, all uh, milieus of society. And um, what, we, what we need is a lot of information on the left side, you see it here, uh, consultation processes, cooperation, collaboration, and empowerment, of course, that's really important, empowerment of individuals, but also of, of, uh, um, of industrial actors, um, of administrative actors. And this ne means we need the information about uh, how much is climate changing, and this is where climate services come into play, and what are adaptation options, and show clearly that the adaptation to climate change has limits. There is a, the limit of adaptation. There was a whole research area which unfortunately has a bit of a, uh, uh, has a bit of a lack of intention in the last 10 years, but there is limits to adaptation and we cannot adapt to uh, warming beyond 2, 2.5 degree. And, um, and this means uh, in order to support the decision making, we have to develop here what we say climate services uh, available climate information. And this is what we, we did in collaboration uh, already with uh, NCDR and, and uh, uh, TCCIP and Garrix and uh, Kuo was, uh, uh, was the city we were looking at. And I'm glad that Ruting is in the room and uh, maybe they can discuss with you a little bit our new products and ideas so that uh, decision making can be uh, done easier and forward looking with tailor-made climate information and knowledge, of course, uh, the local knowledge, which is important. So in order to create those climate services, we already need the dialogue in, in, uh, in, the, in, in between, let's say, policy, uh, society, and uh, or civil society, and science. And um, to create these um, climate service products, we go from the scientific process to the societal benefit. So, of course, we need monitoring and modeling. I mean, that's what is key. And last time I talked about it pretty much uh, in that, and I saw, showed you a little bit the global warming uh, modeling uh, at the beginning. And we, uh, and we really need the monitoring. And we also have now the challenge to monitor adaptation success. It's fully unclear what we have to monitor here. Then we need a high level of data exploration and so that we can create knowledge, integrate here in this uh, middle layer, integrate the local data, the local knowledge, the non-scientific knowledge um, within a co-creation process to customize uh, products and uh, support decisions. And this of course is a circle which just will never end, I guess, because we will have more and more uh, demands, more and more benefits, uh, requirements will change in the scientific progress too. Gerex is doing this and uh, this is how we work and this we do this in the way that we try to connect um, right from the beginning from the initiation of the, the, the prototype product idea um, the user's knowledge in the upper part here with the, the scientific knowledge in a meandering way in a uh, uh, process of transdisciplinary to develop prototype products um, with a lot of knowledge transfer, to bring in quality standards for climate services, and then to, to end up with knowledge transfer and, um, and technological transfer when we have, of course, evaluated the process and 
uh, we also sometimes do a post evaluation of our output outcome and impacts, but uh, before we really upscale the product. Yeah, you see, there's a lot of things which we have to do, but um, it's really important that we connect the idea of climate services, so knowledge about climate change, with the idea of adapting to what we have already pushed, you know, heavy rain, droughts, uh, storms, uh, weather and climate has already changed and often our infrastructure is not fit for the purpose for today. But if we want to change it, we have to have in mind how the climate might change in the future. But at the same time, be as, as efficient, as serious, as fast as we can to reduce emissions as fast as we can and to develop technologies and to uh, for uh, carbon dioxide removal for the future in a societal friendly sustainable way and with this i like to point you to our network the negative emissions network and uh, you're highly welcome to join it for further discussions thank you very much Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Yuzo, uh, Professor uh, Yukov. And uh, uh, now we have uh, about 40 minutes for Q&A. So uh, I like the idea you mentioned about the uh, two sides of the same coin about to see the mitigation and the adaptation. Uh, I think that's, uh, we are, in a sense, we, are th we, we think the strategy or the, uh, the, uh, the action taken for, from the adaptation issue also consider the co-benefit for the um, mitigation as you like as well for the, um, the action taken for the mitigation should think consider the not to um, cause or induce any uh, male adaptation on the adaptation action i like the idea but uh, unfortunately currently in taiwan uh, most uh, agency they didn't think that way and uh, because of net zero, we have a lot of effort. We, right now we move on to the uh, mitigation part. And uh, uh, it, it's kind of sad, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, now we, we've tried to open for uh, Q&A. So uh, uh, anyone from the... the the side from the floor, I want to ask something to talk to uh, Dr. Jokob. I'd like to make a comment, a small comment on the comment of the chair. Uh, actually, sir, the chair, uh, the Professor Lee himself, himself was actually is is right now is also acting the program manager. So it actually is, he has a really uh, some power, some planning uh, to have some education uh, planning. Just a big comment to you, yeah. Right? No, 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 no. It's wrong. You, you got a wrong impression about what's the power, okay? I, I think uh, there's one question. Uh, okay, there's one question from the Slido, so I can uh, I, I'm going to say that for 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 our keynote speaker. Uh, the question is about: Could you address the barriers to scaling up carbon dioxide removal through a transdisciplinary approach? So the question is about how to scale up the 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 the, the carbon dioxide removal upscale. What's the barrier? Yeah, so maybe let me first start with uh, uh, expanding a little bit on what you just said before. So I think it's important to have adaptation and mitigation always jointly in all discussions. So whenever you are um, remodeling or rebuilding uh, or repairing your infrastructure, it is important to, on the one hand, try to be as energy efficient as, and ideally go into renewable energies. And uh, at the same time, think about, is this infrastructure vulnerable to climate change? So are you putting your, your, um, your, um, uh, your uh, let's say, um, uh, the track of the, of the railway 
in areas which might be flooded in the future. So this is a typical example of uh, we are developing more and more railways because we, we want to get rid, in, in Europe for example, get rid, rid of the tremendous amount of individual cars, driving cars, even if they are electric or hydrogen. But uh, so if you now look into where, where you, you build your, the tracks of your railway, for example, consider if the, in the future is flooding and they will be flooded and the infrastructure will not work anymore. It's just one example. And uh, so that's, that's one thing to, to think about. On the other hand, if you, if you are building infrastructure, it's also important to look at the uh, CO2 um, release in the lifetime of the infrastructure. So big buildings, the CO2 release in big buildings uh, is uh, when you develop, when you build new buildings and when you, uh, when you take them down. So 30, 40% is in the, is when you, when you build the building with a lot of concrete, then during the lifetime you have about 30, 40% and then you have 15, 20% when you take them down. So look, I think it's important that we, we are more aware of the entire life cycle um, of infrastructure and, um, and infrastructure is just an example. And now if, you, if I come to your uh, net zero uh, emission uh, activities, uh, unfortunately I'm not fully informed about all activities, but I do think it is really important to um, to look in, in all activities from at least a win-win situation, adaptation and mitigation, and often you have a health aspect also in it. So if you, for example, um, open the concrete in cities, so you unseal uh, in the city the, the surface, I think it's important that if you unseal the surface that you see this as an adaptation measure because water can Percolate into the soil, so you can, uh, or you can, um, uh, you uh, uh, so you, you do not have the, the big flooding anymore. You can you can bring in there some vegetation, which is a mitigation measure. So uh, even this uh, adaptation measure in a city, which looks like a pure adaptation me measure, is a mitigation measure. In addition, if you put vegetation in it, so so I think we are, we have to be <clears throat> really. Uh, creative and I know that you are this and that you have a lot of examples like this. Now let me come to the technologies. I think first of all it's clear we have to reduce emissions and, and that's the bottom line. The part which we cannot reduce anymore needs technology and nature-based solutions, natural things, um, for carbon dioxide removal. So if you now look into your question here, um, I would st let's start with uh, with the, the natural part, the carbon dioxide removal by by wetlands, peat, um, uh, afforestation, um, and and uh, agricultural management uh, <clears throat> options where you can bring through your management more CO2 in the soil. So I think here the disciplinary approach would help a lot in order to 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 get into dialogue with the stakeholders and explain on the one hand what the options are, but here first, where are their, their concerns? Where are their wishes? Where are their demands? And um, so for example, the farmer, would the farmer like to expand or would the farmer like to, um, to uh, kind of sustain the, the, the activity for the next generation. So get in dialogue and then find the, the, the context together jointly with the person. When it comes to technology, I think there, um, there we have two parts where the barriers are. So the, the barriers have to be overcome uh, through dialogues. And you can, for example, the farmers, you can bring in with a little soil app and you can let them measure their CO2 content together with the, with the soil temperature and make a little game out of it and then let them report back and they have a clear role in monitoring uh, adaptation and mitigation success. If, you, if it comes to industry, um, I think we need to understand the risk of the technologies. So uh, at the same time, why we try to develop in some prototype regions, demonstrator regions, why we are trying to develop the technology, we have to have the local stakeholder immediately on board. So not develop a technology, I mean, you all know this, we, we have learned this, 
um, over the last years and decades and, and uh, century that it is always good to have the buy-in from the local people and from the region and make them part of the, of the, uh, of the endeavor. Then the, the barriers will be lower, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more? Okay, uh, Professor Wong. Uh, thank you, Danella, for your uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, I, I would like to give you a little bit of setting here in Taiwan. So uh, we are now uh, in making the third phase of the National Climate Change Adaptation Action Plan for 2023 to 2027. And last week, uh, we happened to have uh, three uh, public hearings, uh, pretty much for the, each sector to present their plan and for receiving the feedbacks. And one of the discussions that I found very interesting is, uh, well, uh, Many of the sectors emphasize the stability or ensuring, for instance, water supply, ensuring the energy supply, etc. But uh, in your slide, actually, uh, you also shown like the, uh, some of the statements from the publication between stability and resilience. And that's exactly that the discussion was talking about. When we emphasize too much the stability, so the resilience might be undervalued or undermined. So I want to know more about your thoughts on how we value these two seeming different concepts, but they are interconnected. But in your practices or experiences, anything that you can uh, elaborate more of your thinking in these two concepts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a this is a very important, very difficult question. But I know I know that Otwin is in the room, so he might uh, later on also help you a little bit on this and uh, discuss discuss with you this point. I do think that, um, and it, it is of course related to risk. I, I do think that the um, what we have to learn is, um, and that for me goes towards resilience is that a resilient system is also a flexible system. So it is a system which can react to or, or re, yeah, react to shocks or it can, it can, uh, it is um, able to, uh, to react on, on external drivers and, and the stability for me is a bit of a stiff system. So stability is, I, I know what I, what I would like to have. I, of course, water supply needs to be stable. I mean, that's uh, for sure. But the way how you construct this, you can construct it in a way that it's more vulnerable to climatic changes or other external shocks. Um, or less vulnerable. And for me, the less vulnerable design of the system is a resilient, uh, is a resilient system. And, uh, and I think that is important to understand, but it also means, of course, that, um, that we uh, look at the interaction of the different uh, systems. Uh, you mentioned the, the water system, the energy system, transport system. Ideally, the entire region is resilient. And not only the water system is resilient. So, so the, 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 what, what's happening in Germany um, at the moment is that the systems are, are designed a, a little bit in isolo isolation from each other. It's getting better now, but, but I think if you look at the resilience of a region, then for example, if the, if the electricity breaks down in one area, you might get electricity from another area. If it's, if it's, Stable, yeah. St stability is is in the center. I I'm I, I don't I don't really know where the where the borders are. I mean, it's it is a difficult it's a difficult uh, uh, um, discussion. But I think the the flexibility and the uh, uh, adjustment in the resilience resilient development. That's why I think the resilient development is so important. It's not only reach a resilient system, but live in a constant resilient development phase or support resilient development. I think that's important. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's a question from the... Uh, Dr. Rain, you want to add on something to the previous uh, questions? Well, 
Well, thank you very much, Daniela, for giving me also the opportunity to say a few words about resilience, uh, because you asked me to do that. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between um, a dynamic concept of stability and a more stable concept of, of resilience. And if you believe that resilience is the capacity of a system to cope with changes and maintain its functionality over time, then I think it's very important to say, what do we want to preserve? And if the services are changing, if you are in a transition, we want to have a, tr um, a, a resilient transition system that means that whatever we want to accomplish during that transition is not being disturbed by external stressors or that we are able to restore that service within um, a very short period of time. And given that kind of a dynamic understanding, I think that has helped us also keep the resilience debate out of just restoring what we have. And, and maybe, maybe I can add one thing here to Ortwin. Uh, and I think this is, uh, is really important when we look at adaptation options and adaptation measures, because sometimes then we, we build the adaptation measure in the, I would say, uh, more stiff and stable system and not flexible enough. So I think that that's a lot of, uh, of discussion needed to connect adaptation to, to uh, resilience. And, and it, 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 that's why I think this uh, uh, climate resilient development is so important to, to understand as a concept and to work through, um, uh, through this uh, concept. Because I, what I see at the moment is that people adapt to the current or maybe future a uh, future uh, condition, but with the today's lifestyle in mind, with the today's stiffness of the systems in mind, and not with a kind of a flexible, uh, resilient uh, uh, system. Yeah. Yes, I think um, following the previous discussion, the, 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 uh, we talked about uh, the resilience, then we said uh, flexibility and the dynamics. That's, that's why we uh, in our past studies, we, we we have been trying to think about how to develop the dynamic adaptation pathway. That means we have different options, and then when we know there is a barrier we cannot cross over, then we can take another, take another pathway to pass through. So it's a it's a concept of dynamic adaptation pathway. Yeah, that's what we did in the uh, adaptation part, but. Uh, currently, we see a lot of uh, different countries that have their own net zero pathway, but we, I haven't seen any country propose the dynamic, dynamic uh, net zero pathway because uh, right now we see there, we, we did have a lot of technology on development and uh, we foresee to meet the 2050 net zero goal, but we have no idea which technology can overcome anything of, of so promising, for example, the hydrogen, for example, the CCS or CCU. We have no idea about that, but, so, but uh, currently uh, we see the pathway for, the, for many countries, they just one line or, or some combination and tell uh, your, your, cities, your, your, your citizens or your people, okay, we are going to meet net zeros, but we are not so sure about the technology. They are already by 2030 or by 2050s. Yeah, so that's another yeah. current comment about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah um, I think that is a very, very important comment which you just made. And uh, I think that is, um, is really difficult. And of course, I'm not an expert. I'm meteorologist. So I'm not politician and <laughs> I'm not an energy system expert. But, but what, what, I, what I hear and see is um, the difficulty to at the same time develop the technology and do the change because we have no time left. I mean, the, the, the change is so urgent that we cannot really wait until we find the best or the, the, until we understand the, 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 uh, the um, uh, um, let's say, the, 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 the um, benefits of the technology or the, or the, um, uh, the difficulties and the, um, the trade-offs uh, in, in between the different systems and so on. So, and that's why I, 
I see that many countries, they go their own ways and they, they do what they can, hopefully, in the current setting. And I think what we have to do is we have to share our expertise. I think there is no, no uh, yes or no or right or wrong. Uh, I think we need all technologies and uh, uh, natural and technological CDR measures. We, um, all technologies uh, immediately to stop fossil fuel burning, immediately stop go to re uh, renewable energies, immediately stop the, the uh, emissions. And, and I think that's important. Um, and while we are doing this, we will learn about the trade-offs. And, and that's why we share the global, we need to share our global experiences and our knowledge. And I hope that this will be possible in the future. And I think we need a very good uh, dialogues on, on, on all the different uh, um, options. Yeah, yes, and, and I think, um some something uh, or some technology are quite for sure for example or some development are quite for sure for example we are looking for the decarbonization uh, decarbonization energy and we are looking for the renewable energy but uh, during the break I, talk, I have a chance to talk to Dr. Ren about the hydrogen and currently uh, hydrogen is going to account for 9 to 10 percent of power supply projected in 2050s but where can we get so many hydrogen or, or although, so I think hydrogen also have some position paper or, or the hydrogen how hydrogen can be produced or used or imported in German so not, not, I so I see hydrogen <coughs> hydrogen is some kind of uncertain technology we know that can play some role but we have no idea how much hydrogen can help us in yeah. net zero? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's that's true, and that I think is also true for Germany, uh, unless Otwin, you have newer results. But but what what um, but but nevertheless, I think it's really important to to work with uh, the idea of hydrogen. So we are currently at, at our center starting a huge activity on. On the um, on the entire life cycle and, um, embedded in, in hydrogen uh, creation to use and or development and use and when you look at um, at the climate uh, uh, change and adaptation again here then uh, in the northern part of Germany just north of Hamburg um, there's an area where they would like to uh, produce uh, um, with renewable energy hydrogen. And uh, already 10 companies are coming and trying to build um, com uh, uh, companies to their infrastructure um, and discussing with the local administration about uh, the possibilities to install big hydrogen production sites. No one, no one thought about the water availability which is needed in order to produce the hydrogen. It takes a tremendous amount of water and the, the local water managers have now the task to assess, do we have enough water for, I mean, for how much hydrogen do we have enough water taken also into account that we have to have drinking water for society and so on and so forth. So, so uh, and if you are in an area, I mean, luckily we are in an area close to the coast and, and, uh, um, and not prone to droughts. But uh, if you're an area which in the future might have lack of, of uh, precipitation and, and is maybe more ex exposed to drought situation, this might create another problem for new technology. So that's what I meant when I said if the, the, the measure you take is vulnerable um, uh, in the future to climatic change. So that's why we have to think, bring everything together into, into a system thinking. Uh, which is difficult, but uh, but using systems and system thinking and subsystem thinking is key here. And having, uh, I would say, um, prototype demonstrator and living labs. So uh, immediately go into the dialogue with industry in the region so that they can maybe um, uh, directly work on the hydrogen supply chain and, and develop it in, in one go. But there's another point here. If we think about um, installing uh, direct air capture technology, for example, 
um, there's a question from my side. If we bring in uh, uh, direct air capture um, in an area where we can also then develop a resilient lifestyle, I mean, we could, because if you, if you bring it there, a big infrastructure, you might be able to create a, a, a sustainable life around if you, if you create it uh, with the new money which is coming in, maybe it's connected to the uh, emission trading uh, if you have a direct air capture it, in your, on your country, someone has to get the credits. So it's unclear what's happening there, but it might also be a chance for innovation and do the innovation in a sustainable and just lifestyle. So, I mean, that is something which we also should think together in this system thinking. Uh, yeah. uh, Lin from uh, Reef Society and the Policy Research Center and the uh, uh, Governance Transition Team, uh, National uh, SciTech uh, Council. Uh, successful uh, Professor Jacobs uh, talks on uh, climate information disclosure. Uh, we know uh, climate disclosure. Uh, uh, climate information disclosure uh, helps to uh, uh, prevent or, or, or response to uh, disaster, but uh, the climate information is also uh, sensitive to uh, business or, or, or is uh, related uh, stakeholders. Uh, so uh, would you like to share uh, more details on uh, the sincerity uh, or importance of uh, tidal climate information, or would you like to give some example of tidal uh, climate information uh, and uh, its related policy connected uh, with science? Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I think climate information and climate data is, is very important. And I personally think that um, um, I think it, it should be a public good. Um, so um, I understand that with, with hydrogen uh, or hydroclimate information, there uh, is a lot of money to make. And I see this if I look at, uh, at many places. But I do think that um, in, in the light of the challenge ahead of us, living in a changed climate, I think it is in the, in the um, uh, in the um, responsibility of the national governance to make sure that the information which people need is available. And I'm sorry, this is my dog in the back. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry for this. <laughs> Someone was at the door, so I'm sorry that you hear my dog. But um, yeah, this is life. <laughs> so um, I think the, it is really important that we, we um, um, we, we come up to a global understanding of uh, knowledge and data sharing. And I understand that, we, uh, that it should cost money if you um, derive a product from the data, but the data themselves should be free. And you probably have heard about this huge initiative called EVE, E-V-E. It's a new initiative which has just been released, I think today or on Friday, um, of global and regional climate modelers worldwide, because we do think we need a much larger effort on developing local and climate change information on, uh, through modeling and through monitoring and share the data in, a, in an open and, uh, and uh, fair and just way in order to support those who are most vulnerable. And, uh, and I think this is really of utmost importance that we make sure that everyone who needs the information can get the information. How this goes hand in hand with policy is of course, uh, um, uh, I would say uh, different from country to country. But, uh, but I, I, I think what's very clear is, um, I think the, the um, um, the, uh, the business model involved here should be for the hydrometrological data 
should be a business model in the way that you only pay for the consultancy, but not pay for the data themselves. If there's a company involved which, uh, from which you need information in order to design the best option jointly for the system, jointly with the hydromorphological data, I think it needs a very trustful way to also um, uh, educate the, the company in a way that they can um, work with hydrometrological data without um, um, open up their own data pool. So I understand there is this, this uh, um, private uh, um, and of course business related uh, uh, um, way of handling their own, their own data and I think if you develop consultancies like we do it in Gerix, we developed um, a framework for a company so, so that they can assess if they and their portfolio is vulnerable to climate change. They can do it themselves. They only get our information on temperature and precipitation and so on, what they need, and they get a bit of education and guidance, but then they can work with their own trusted consultants to, to find out if there is a, 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 an opportunity or a risk for the country. But hydrometrological data should be public. Uh, okay, so I'd like to make some uh, comment on the previous discussion topics about adaptation and the mitigation. So I, I think this is a difficult to uh, run in away from the essential uh, social infrastructure and the political infrastructure existing already in this society or in this country. When we talk about, the, as we mentioned uh, uh, earlier, about the just transition and also the medication adaptation. So the, the, the technology or the policy is entangled with the society or societal consideration. So in this way, for example, taking the example of the high energy, uh, sorry, the hydrogen energy uh, issue. So the Taiwan is uh, the energy import country, uh, more than 95%, uh, even more. And when we take into account uh, this issue uh, to discussion, so we really need to also to have a totally different economic and global uh, consideration as compared to the hydrogen energy policy in Germany or, the, or in Norway or in, in Scotland. So this is, I think that this is a very good example. And, and I also, I think the main comment on that in the just transition can be or could be a very good leverage point to change the existing society infrastructure uh, to become a more uh, fair, uh, more, uh, if you the resilience, so, and and the question would be uh, connecting to the follow up from the comment here. The question would be: I think so I still remember the, the several years ago so during the discussion with your college and your member. Uh, you mentioned us. Uh, you mentioned me to me. Uh, there are already many many company approach to the galleries to searching for the service. But you are not allowed to provide, I think, 15% uh, or something that you have a limitation to provide service because this is a public interest. So my question would be, uh, how is the societal consideration particularly involved or taken into account uh, for your, I think, the scientific provides service, uh, uh, service in your uh, research? Uh, in both sides, in company or the also in the in the government policy, I think that this did be different from the research from the uh, Professor Rain at that time. So you are starting from the point from the social science and from the policy for the more I would say the more qualitative uh, consideration. But in your institute, I saw a very strong quantitative. You provide a concrete pathway uh, for the. Uh, for the adaptation or some, or for even for the company. So how, how can you combine this uh, together in your program or in your research? 
Yeah, let me, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand, but if we go back to the last slide, which I showed you with this, uh, with this uh, curve in. So what we do is, so first of all, we are, uh, we are not a pure service, we are a research institute. So that, that's first to say. So whatever we do, um, if we develop something new, it must be innovative and research uh, and driving research. At the same time, our task is to provide, um, to support society to adapt to climate change. So first it was adaptation. In the last years, GEREX has changed and we are now um, talking about um, supporting society um, to, uh, uh, to transform or, or in the transformation to, uh, uh, let's say, maybe net zero lifestyle, or we, I would put it uh, to a 1.5 degree lifestyle. That's, uh, I, you have probably seen some literature on this. Um, so support regions to transform and this means not only uh, developing adaptation services, but also mitigation services, but also um, uh, uh, dialogues and, and interest uh, dialogues and, and formats in a way that um, that they can uh, they can develop the system. So the system thinking. So how do we do this? <clears throat> we do this only with some key clients. So could be a key industry could be a key uh, city and we are not doing this for everyone at the moment but we try to do this and develop it with some some uh, key uh, uh, partner then what we do first is if we have the partner let's say we have uh, we had the partner kfw the german development bank um, we were sitting with them and 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 discussing where where do they where they, are they connected to climate change? And then we came to the climate fact sheet. So, so we are in dialogue, for example, also with the city of Rostock, which is a relatively small city in the northern part of Germany. And there the, the railway company asked us, that's why I talked about the railway track before, um, we see a regular flooding of our tracks. How will this change in the future? So the, the, the societies, this, the partner from the societal side comes to us with a question or with a demand. And then we develop jointly where and how this question can be answered by climate knowledge. So we are not, uh, we are not, uh, we do not have, um, uh, let's say we, we are not developing adaptation options, but we connect our climatic knowledge to, to, the, to the dialogue. And then we provide the uh, the product which with um, uh, which the, the 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 client can use and do some education, so that they uh, we educate, for example, their consultancies to use our data. So that's the way how we are interconnecting with society. We are not starting from a societal change point of view because we are climate scientists. Main the ma major part of GERIX is, is coming from the climate science and climate knowledge, not from a, um, uh, let's say, from a, from a social science. We have social scientists at, at, in, the, in, in the staff, but of course, but we are coming from, from uh, we would like to understand where can the climate knowledge help and support the decisions. So, uh, for example, um, um, Cristobal, one of my, my um, postdocs now, PhD students, former, he looked where, where in, in the government, in the administration of a city, at which level is it most important and efficient to introduce climate data knowledge. So it's not looking like governance structures and trying to change governance structures, but looking at where is the connection to the climate and climate knowledge. So it's completely different to what, what uh, Otwin Renn and Riffs is doing because they come from a transformational side, as far as I understood, and Otwin, you are in the room, and all of your, your colleagues, you're, you're looking at how can we, how can we support and, and make, uh, and, and, and yeah, support transformation. For us, it's where in the transformation can we add our climate knowledge? 
so that's that's more specific and narrow to uh, uh, but that's why we can also work so closely together um when I understood you correct here, you, you were asking about the, um, uh, at the same time, now taking the advantage to change societal life and to change society and lifestyle. And I think this is really important. I think it's really important to um, uh, try to get people engaged in a way um, that they are now, I mean, it's now on us. Uh, that we do have the, the, the duty, but we also have the opportunity to develop uh, an innovative, sustainable lifestyle for the future, for the next generations. I mean, it's on us now, and not everyone is allowed and can do this. I mean, uh, people 50 years ago, they would not even know about it, but it's, we are now in a, in a time period where we also have the privilege to develop lifestyles which are sustainable and, and just and um, and climate neutral and climate resilient. So uh, so this positive notion with new jobs with new um, with new concepts is something which we should which we try to communicate and for which we should try to to um, to get people engaged and and uh, like like a like a trend. No? So like like everyone would like to have an iPhone. Everyone would like to be with us in the trend to a sustainable lifestyle. So we have to push for this in a positive uh, note, mode, I would say. Thank you, Diana, because uh, we already run out of time. Yeah. But I will still have one quick question from our internet. Uh, the question is, can the Net Zero 2015 system enhance capabilities for low-income country? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I do think yes, because I think it's in a way that we are sharing our information more and that we can, of course, avoid, um, uh, um, uh, avoid uh, uh, the same mistakes which we made in, uh, when we now um, support and uh, when, when low income countries are developing. I would say it is a it is a very important part of developing countries and the development in low income com uh, com countries sorry and uh, <clears throat> and i think that um, we we, um, we we should uh, look at the climate fi climate financing and the opportunities first uh, so that we support in, uh, low income countries and try to get the vulnerability lower Uh, close this session, session and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yukov from internet to join us and the wish next time we can meet you in person, have more fruitful discussion. And thank you all for attending this sub these sessions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And have a nice, nice two days. Thank you. <laughs>